Hello, I'm Andrew Kamedaich, and we're continuing our look at pre-modern Japan. Today we're going to be talking about Godaigo Tenno and the revolt against Kamakura. We're going to see how one sovereign conspired to overthrow the Bakufu that we've been looking at. Now, we'll start as usual with a couple of key points. Kamakura Bakufu had been providing security but its success so far had depended on rewarding its vassals and maintaining legitimacy, so based on that vassalage system that I talked about a while back. Meanwhile, the court began to chafe under co-ruling with the Bakufu, and some court leaders had been looking for a chance to reclaim stronger court authority. Now, the best early example of this was the Jokyu Rebellion. Retired sovereign Gotoba disliked dealing with the Bakufu, he felt that he should have direct control again. And therefore, in 1221, he gathered together some warriors in Kyoto and declared the Hojo regent a rebel. Hojo Masako responded by rallying the Kamakura warriors together and reminded them of how much they owed to her husband Yoritomo. She said that everything you have is due to Yoritomo, his favor is higher than mountains, deeper than the sea. If you forget how much you owe him and take the side of the court, present yourself right now. And so, of course, in front of this, no one had the bravery to stand up to her and say, I'm going to go join the court instead, and so she was able to rally all of the warriors to her side. Well, as the Bakufu forces set out and clashed with uh, Gotoba's rebels, his forces were far too weak and they were promptly defeated by the Bakufu. The Bakufu at this point had the perfect opportunity to try to replace the court altogether, but instead they just elected to restore the status quo. So, they sent Gotoba and his sons off into exile, they appointed a new Tenno and a new Inn, this, of course, required a little bit of messing around because it meant that the new retired sovereign had not actually in fact been a sovereign, but never mind, whatever works. And then they promptly hit the reset button on the dual polity and kept that system going. However, they weren't quite willing to pretend that nothing had happened, and therefore they established an office, the Rokuhara Tandai, consisting of some deputies in Kyoto to keep an eye on the court, just in case they tried something like that again. Now, after the rule of the sovereign Gosaga, his sons fought over succession, and this resulted in the creation of two royal lines. Kameyama, his descendants became known as the Daikakuji, so the junior of the two lines, and Gohugakusa, on the other hand, his descendants became known as the Jimyoin, so the senior of the two lines. Now, as the two lines struggled for power, the Bakufu itself got involved, and a decision was eventually made to alternate the throne between the two lines every ten years. Now, this system worked fairly well up until 1318, when Hanazono Tenno of the Jimyoin abdicated, following the rules, and then Godaigo Tenno from the Daikakuji line ascended the throne on schedule. So, the two royal lines work like this. You can see we have Gosaga Tenno right at the top here, and then we have the two royal lines. We have the Daikakuji over here, and the Jimyoin here. And you can see by the numbers here, so it bounces back and forth. So, one, two, three, uh, four, and so forth. All the way down to, we have right here at the bottom, we have Hanazono here, so he steps down from the throne right on schedule, and Godaigo over here, number eight, he takes on the throne. Now, Godaigo Tenno, however, had no intention of playing by the rules. He'd been reading a lot about history, and he was very inspired by the Heian period reign of Daigo Tenno, as well as the power of the Chinese emperors. He hated sharing power with the Bakufu, and he began to conspire against it, just as Gotoba had done before him. Now, if we ask ourselves, why was Godaigo Tenno so interested in the Chinese emperors? Part of this is because of the unrivaled power that a Chinese emperor could command over his realm. 
This had never been the case in Japan, even with the great glory days of back in the Nara period and so forth, when the sovereigns were at their height. They never had the direct kind of power and authority that a Chinese emperor could command. And so it's understandable, perhaps, why a Japanese Tenno would read about these figures and say, gee, I wish I could have that kind of power and authority. So, Godaigo starts plotting. He thinks that he's going to overthrow the Bakufu and restore the Tenno to full authority. Well, he makes a series of plots. In 1324, his first plot is discovered. The Bakufu is prepared to let this one slide, and so they basically take care of some of the ringleaders, put things back as they were, give him a warning, and so things are allowed to continue. But Godaigo doesn't learn his lesson. In 1331, he tries again. Second plot is discovered, and Godaigo this time tries to rally and fight against the Bakufu, but he's defeated and exiled to Oki, just like Gotoba before him. Of course, once you were sent off to an island in exile, it was not expected that you would ever return. However, not long after this, Godaigo was able to actually do the impossible. His allies were able to rescue him from Oki and bring him back, whereupon he raised another army and tried again. At this point, a very important figure enters the narrative, Ashikaga Takaoji, a very powerful warrior under the Bakufu system. So the Bakufu sends Ashikaga Takaoji to go and defeat Godaigo. But Ashikaga was not someone who went on this mission very happily. Rather, he was very disillusioned. He felt that the Bakufu was not trustworthy, that they had betrayed the warriors. And therefore, feeling frustrated and disillusioned with the whole system, when he actually met Godaigo, he decided to switch sides, capturing the Rokuhara Tandai and joining Godaigo's side instead. And there were some other major figures who were also found on Godaigo's side. So Nita Yoshisada was another of his generals, and also most famously here, Kusunoki Masashige. Kusunoki Masashige is particularly interesting as a case because he illustrates how Godaigo was willing to go outside of the sort of standard sources for recruiting one's warriors. Kusunoki Masashige was not someone who had a courtier background. He wasn't someone who came from an established warrior family. He was someone who was essentially considered kind of a thug or a local bandit type of figure. And so there is, again, a type of contract that is based here. On the one hand, Kusunoki Masashige is able to get protection and support from Godaigo because he can get the type of recognition that normally only an established warrior family would have. In exchange, Godaigo is, of course, gaining a powerful soldier on his side. And so we have this interesting kind of situation where we have the conventional warriors are rallying on the Bakufu side, but a large contingent of them have come over to join Godaigo, along with Ashikaga Takahoji. At the same time, we also have some other newer figures, people who are outside of the established warrior hierarchy, who are kind of tagging along with Godaigo as well, because if he is successful and overthrows Kamakura, then they can become instated as powerful figures within the new system. So, Godaigo's forces in 1333 are able to destroy the Hojo, they end the Kamakura Bakufu, and Godaigo promptly declares a restoration. He tries to create a new system where the Tenno had great authority, something that had never before been seen. And indeed, Godaigo referred to it in this way. He said, The examples of today are the innovations of yesterday. My actions will become the precedents of the future. In other words, things that are normal today, when they were first implemented, were considered revolutionary. So what I'm doing today will become the new standard for the future. So he's aware that he's doing something different. He's aware that he's trying to send the country in a very different direction, with direct rule of a very powerful sovereign, something that had not really been seen before. Well, unfortunately, the system didn't really get off to a great start. The warriors were unhappy with the Kenmu system. They felt disrespected and unfairly rewarded. One of the reasons that they had been willing to join Godaigo 
had been that they felt the Barkafu had not been keeping its side of that vassalage bargain, they hadn't been treated fairly, hadn't been rewarded despite fighting valiantly against the Mongols and so forth. And therefore, maybe it was time to try a new leader. Maybe this Godaigo fellow can give them a better deal and treat them better than the Kamakura Bakufu had been doing. This is one of the reasons why, when Gotoba tried to rally people to his banner, he wasn't particularly successful. It was still early days in the Kamakura Bakufu, and the warriors generally had less reason to complain about it. But by Godaigo's time, they're very frustrated with the Bakufu, and therefore they're more likely to give this upstart sovereign a chance. But then, of course, he kind of blows the opportunity by not rewarding them fairly, and they begin to wonder maybe they made the wrong decision. Takaoji sees this coming. He warns Godaigo, but his, reward, his warnings are shut down. Takaoji has to set out to suppress a rebellion, tries to restore order, but Godaigo becomes suspicious of him. He thinks that Takaoji is planning betrayal, trying to make himself a powerful person instead of allowing the sovereign to remain in charge. Promptly, Godaigo sends Nita and Kusunoki to go and fight Takaoji. Godaigo refuses to negotiate, even after Takaoji has been fighting against Niti Yoshisada and Kusunoki Masashige. He then demands that Kusunoki fight a suicidal last stand against the Ashikaga forces. When this doesn't work, understandably, because Kusunoki had warned him that it wouldn't work, and yet Godaigo demanded he go and fight nevertheless, Godaigo manages to retreat to Yoshino, where he sets up a new court, leaving Takaoji in control of Kyoto. As a result, the realm was divided into two courts, the north and the south. Now, what this means is the dual polity through the history of the Kamakura era naturally had seen some considerable conflict between court and Bakufu. However, when it could, the Bakufu tried to preserve the status quo. So remember when we talk about this kind of stereotype in Japanese history about how the warrior government had been trying to overthrow the Tenno and take away his power and so forth, this is not quite true. The Bakufu had numerous occasions on which they could have wiped out the court's authority and gotten rid of the sovereign, and they chose not to. In every case, they tried to go back to this dual polity system. In the end, Godaigo manages to destroy the Bakufu, but in so doing, he actually wipes out the old role of the court as well. And so what happened is that the way was cleared for a new political order, something quite different from the dual polity of before. Thank you very much.